I'm Pastor Joseph Tolton, and it's my pleasure to be with you. I'm live from the United Methodist Church General Conference here in Tampa, Florida, and I'm glad to be representing the Love Your Neighbor Coalition. It's my pleasure on today to welcome Reverend Dr. Jimmy Dubay, who is the Director of Admissions and the Academic Dean at the United Theological College in Harare, Zimbabwe. And along with us also is Reverend Sifisu Mpofu, who is the president of United Theological College. Welcome, it's wonderful to have both of you here with us today. I'll Thank start you. With, with you, I'll defer to your rank as the president. Please tell us about the United Theological College. Tell us a little bit about its history and talk to us about how it's structured and what makes it unique. Thank you very much. United Theological College is the biggest uh, ecumenical institution in Zimbabwe. It is a church-run college that trains ministerial leaders as well as teachers mm -hmm. for the church. The school was founded in 1954, originally by the Methodist Church in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. In 1959, it became ecumenical when other mainline churches in Zimbabwe decided to join hands with the United with the Methodist Church so that they give the school the ecumenical nature. Um, the idea behind making the school ecumenical was born out of the then Rhodesia Christian Council. The churches were working together under Rhodesia Christian Council and they decided that it was going to be good for them to work together even on matters of leadership, development, ministerial training. Hence, the churches came together and then the college became united and ecumenical in nature. Reverend Pofu, you bring together students from various backgrounds and a part of what you do uniquely well is conflict resolution. How is it that you use that element which is very distinct about the school to be a participatory voice in the political context of Zimbabwe? For me, United Theological College is the heart of the church. I'm saying it's the heart of the church because the church in Zimbabwe has had a very long tradition, a tradition where the church has fought for social justice, the church has been the voice of the marginalized the peoples, the communities, during and after the liberation war that led to the country's independence in 1980. The post-independence situation has not been very easy in terms of uh, the majority of the people enjoying their rights. And the church has remained a very vocal. The voice of the church has not died in the process. It was the church that raised the issues of the 1980s when there were internal challenges in the country that led to the death of over 20,000 people. The church remained active and called upon the international community to help assist the Zimbabweans to attend to the political challenges and the social difficulties that the nation faced at that particular time. Dr. Tube has already made reference to the fact that uh, the last five years there were challenges in the country leading to the formation of the government of national unity. The formation of the government of national unity was not um, a product of SATAC alone or the countries in southern Africa. The church in Zimbabwe played a crucial role. And when I'm saying the church in Zimbabwe played a crucial role, I must make it very clear that many of those church leaders are former students of United Theological College. We pride ourselves for, of that fact that the churches that have provided leadership in the time of crisis are those leaders are former students of UTC for your own interest. The first president of the independent Zimbabwe was a former student of United Theological College. Now there is an organ on national healing and reconciliation. There is a body called the Ecumenical Church Leaders Forum 
that is providing conflict resolution skills, management, and the, the, the whole element of how to reconcile communities that have been polarized by our political disturbances. The leadership of the Ecumenical Church Leaders Forum, the three top leaders are our former students, and one of those in the leadership only left UTC about six years ago. So we see ourselves as being the heart of, uh, of the church in Zimbabwe and as active players in search of peace and social stability in the country. But now coming back to your question, how does United Theological College connect with the, the United Methodist General Conference? Amongst the eight churches that own UTC, United Theological College, uh, is the United Methodist Church. And uh, interestingly, a third of the student enrollment at the United Theological College comes from the United Methodist Church, a third of our students. Currently, we have a student population of almost 300, and a third of those are United Methodist students. So the United Methodist Church in Zimbabwe is a huge institution in terms of the student population at the college. Those students from the United Methodist come from a number of countries in Southern Africa. Zimbabwe in particular will contribute the majority of the students. Some students come from Zambia, some students come from Malawi, and you can see the, the, the role that the United Methodist, or let me say the responsibility that the United Methodist have over this college by the fact of sending many of their students for ministerial development or training at the United Theological College, it simply means or follows that the United Methodist values the programs at United Theological College. Sadly, very unfortunately, the college was built in 1954. Its infrastructure has not been uh, growing to match the population growth of the student population. So that has become a challenge, and there is a very glaring, at times embarrassing challenge to the leadership at UTC, the management, and both the, the board of directors, the college council, which consists of the heads of denominations, the bishops, the United Methodist bishops sit in the board at UTC. What is embarrassing is the fact that our own students have to be crowded in very limited houses, particularly the married students. You will find that married students will have to share a five-roomed house. You find three families sharing that. And then we say it's bad, but it's a challenge that we are facing and the churches are sending us students. We need to train them. We need to equip them. If we say no, the church says, then where do these students go? It is interesting for me to also say that the United Methodist Church in Zimbabwe has always preferred that their ministerial candidates be trained first and foremost at United Theological College before they proceed for postgraduate studies at African University. But one then must ask himself, has the United Methodist Church really invested at the United Theological College as they have invested at Africa University? The, the answer is obvious, not quite. Not quite because the United Theological College story has not been shared across the world like the story of Africa University. And it's my hope and my, my belief that this platform will help many in the, in the leadership of the United Methodist Church and the, the ordinary members in the circuit, in the congregations, to also appreciate that 
besides the story of Africa University, there is also the story of UTC. And the same needs that prevail at Africa University are the same needs that prevail at the United Theological College. So any support given to one and not both does not assist us to train and develop quality leaders under conducive a conducive environment where students' welfare is, is also taken into consideration as a priority. Are you convinced that the reason you haven't received the resources is only because your story hasn't been properly told? Or are there some other reasons that you want to share with us? I guess it's the, the question of visibility more than anything else because um, you know, this is the primary place where the ministers are trained, but um, not much has been happening, I, I guess, in terms of really uh, mobilizing resources. And um, because United Theological College is composed of so many churches, there is that tendency of thinking that maybe the other person will take care of the problem and maybe the other denomination will do that. But I think the time has come for the church is really to come up and say, we need to do something about this. Who's left on the margin socially? It begins with a conversation about economics and what's happening with the poor and the disenfranchised. That conversation zeroes in on women who are generally the poorest among us, particularly women who are left to raise children on their own. You all have spoken quite a bit about this social witness that is a real emphasis of the school. Could you talk to me a little bit about how your students participate in grappling with some of the hotbed social issues of the day? I would say because I guess Zimbabwe has been mad in a political crisis, you will find that the barometer of uh, what issues come to the top and what do people focus on then are uh, driven by the situation. And so you'll be, you, it's not surprising that in Zimbabwe, f first and foremost, people are focusing on political uh, questions, like which is human rights question from the political angle, and then HIV and AIDS, yeah. etc. And then I'm not saying these issues are not important, but because of what we've just gone through, the focus is on that. But I guess theologically we will say, when people have gone through trauma, like we have gone through political and social trauma, there is no way we can say we will not focus on issues that really impinge on human existence. And as uh, theology, uh, theologians, our emphasis is on human rights and the rights of everyone, everybody to be included here. Yeah. Well, um, in terms of who we are and what we exist for, what we believe as a college is the fact that God created us and in his image mm -hmm. and that each and every human being has the right to life, right to freedoms and uh, right to existence. Our programs seek to empower student ministers to be leaders, to provide pastoral guidance to provide leadership to communities without segregating people into different groups. We, we know the ministry of Jesus Christ was the ministry to all and for all. And our, it is our understanding as college that uh, we have this particular approach that uh, follows the Jesus model, that uh, you are a leader to a people yeah. who have different um, uh, expectations, different assumptions, different uh, ideologies, and uh, different challenges and worries. And what a minister must do is to be able to minister to all. But how that happens outside the, 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 the curricula of the college becomes something else. If there are challenges, then they become denominational challenges. But in terms of providing a curricula that prepares students to reach out to all, to see in each and mm. every individual 
uh, the face of Christ and uh, to understand that we are dealing with people of God, regardless of how they look, how they think, how they feel, how they behave in their own human context. We say minister to them because the ministry is a call to provide abundance of life to those who are in need. You, you also mentioned the aspect of women. Very interestingly for us, we have a department which we call the women's department within the structures of the college. Mm -hmm. In that particular department, we note that the church in Zimbabwe and also in Africa in particular has always enjoyed the leadership of male. It is only in the last couple of decades that the church was comfortable to, to also embrace the leadership of women, especially ministerial leadership of women. Uh, so we decided that alongside our ministerial programs, we will also have a women's department so that we equip women to have those skills necessary for leadership so that they become confident in what they do. And not only women, we also have provided um, a, a department that takes care of the, the, the children uh -huh. within the campus uh -huh. in the context of a kindergarten and a preschool because our students come with families. Yes. And we say we need to do something because we are developing human beings as families and we need to take care of the in that context. And I'll add that um, uh, our, in terms of our enrollment, we train both <laughs> male and female pastors. Yeah. We, are, we are not uh, exclusive in, the, in yeah. that nature, yes. You all have spoken quite a bit about this social witness that is a real emphasis of the school. Could you talk to me a little bit about how your students participate in grappling with some of the hotbed social issues of the day? I think to answer that question, one has to refer back to their dissertations because after studying together for three years, yes. they go out on their fourth year to do some research. And the topics that they tend to focus on, I think, are telling of what exactly is going on because they tend to focus mostly on social issues more than on, you know, like uh, what I would call like... Um, uh, you know, things that divide people, yes. but they are more on the issues that affect communities. Mm -hmm. It's really the agenda is set by the community, especially when you look at Africa, the strug political struggles, social struggles, and that's what the students tend to focus on. Because most of these students go into the communities and work side by side, and they seem to be facing common challenges and common struggles. And it's interesting because during their fourth year program, what we call a fourth year program, that they do outside the college. We, as a college, do some follow-ups, what we call visit, fourth-year visits, where we visit each individual student in order to assess their performance and also to meet the local leadership in the local churches to hear how these students are performing. Mm -hmm. And it is in that uh, uh, context that we begin to appreciate really what we were doing theoretically in the yes, college. Yes, yeah. Yes. The most interesting thing in Zimbabwe, or just in particular in general in Southern Africa, is that uh, ministers have a forum that brings them together under the ministers' mm -hmm. fraternals. What you realize, what you must realize, is that uh, during training, students get to know each other. In the chapel, they get to appreciate the varied traditions of different denominations. When they go out to work, they realize that they become a network of Christian leaders together in the community. They face the same challenges. And there is traditionally a day, say, it's, most cases is Tuesdays, where ministers in one particular community or society come together to share the story of their work, the challenges they meet to pray together, to fellowship and encourage each other. And under that particular forum, the ministers fraternal, they then develop strategies of how to tackle the challenges that they meet in ministry. So yes, UTC prepares students 
to value that unity, that ecumenical nature, and it becomes easy for them to interact and to strengthen uh, uh, the, 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 their defense walls mm. as they seek to transform the world in ministry because they already know each other. In fact, we train our students to always think outside the box and to read the world as they read the Bible, they have also to read the world. In other words, the, re the world is a big question mark for us that we need each and every theologian to grapple with the answers. There are no answers that are already provided. So that's part of the training. Yeah. United Theological College um, understands itself um, not in the context of the Bible as a closed chapter, but the Bible as the beginning of the unfolding story mm. of God's love for human beings. Mm. Otherwise, we would not bring people to train mm. at the school if the, if the Bible was already closed. Then mm. simply go and read and tell people what it says. <laughs> so what we see in the Bible is uh, God's wisdom that is unfolding mm. and then we allow people to understand the bible from their own context mm. we emphasize the element of praxis here mm. contextual theology now where we are what does the bible say today to us mm. yesterday to the people of israel it said a b c d but the people of israel had a different social context with us mm. Today in Zimbabwe, in Africa in general, what does the Bible say to our own generation in the 21st century? We want to provide biblical models that suit us in our own context and say to people, think, let God speak to you, let the Holy Spirit guide you, use the Bible as the reference point to hear what God's message is for you today so that you become a relevant and authentic pastor to your own context. Tell, help me understand what has informed this openness. I guess United Theological College is a long tradition, as we have heard, of people who have been socially active and um, uh, religiously uh, informed. Yeah. And um, it's been part of who we are. I would imagine that many people would want to support you. Well, Zimbabwe is a very small country. Um, what is popular in Zimbabwe probably are the political challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, people at times tend not to, to see other good things that happen in that mm -hmm. very small country. Mm -hmm. um, the very interesting dimension with the, 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 the role of the church and the theological education in particular in Zimbabwe is that uh, the church is the oldest institution in Zimbabwe uh, that brings masses together. Yeah. It's bigger than the political parties, mm -hmm. the church in Zimbabwe. Politicians have respect of the church in Zimbabwe. During the colonial period, the church lent it the hard way what it meant to be prophetic in the context of suffering. So that was the beginning of the church being reformed toward what God desires the church to be. The very fact that in the liberation context, the church was the first institution to say we need better leadership, meant that the church started to reform at that particular time in its history. And that reformation thrust that gave the church a social and political responsibility in the country did not die. It started to grow and develop into what the church sees itself to be today. So it has been a process. The political challenges beginning in the 19. In the 60s, in the formation of the liberation movements, the church was at the center. So that proactiveness by church leaders have already enabled the church to see its place within the social context 
of our daily challenges and the church has not stopped. We do have, however, in Zimbabwe, churches that will be comfortable to say our job is to pray. Mm -hmm. But that's not the theology of UTC. We say our job is to speak and then to pray. When we have spoken, then we say, God, bless these our ways bless our actions bless our plans bless our activities so that we can be your hands we can be your feet we can be agents of transformation and change in the context of our human challenges reverend dr impufu what would your response be if dr dubé came to you and said that a student was applying their criteria met your standards but this particular student admitted that he or she was gay or lesbian. What would your response be? That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure whether I will provide a straightforward answer in terms of our own context as a school. UTC does not specifically recruit students. The churches recruit students and send those students to us. Our job mainly is simply to receive students that have already been processed by the churches mm -hmm. and we train them. Mm -hmm. We do not interview students in terms of who, who, their agenda and uh, all those things. Those that have been sent to us by the churches, what we look for are the, 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 the academic qualifications and then uh, we see that are the academic qualifications sufficient and then we process them through the Ministry of Higher Education to verify whether the certificates are authentic or not and we then enroll. Yes. 